switch AC just appears. Okay. Um, I want to announce audio and tonight video recording in addition to the minutes. Any public comment? Going once, going twice. Very good, no public comment. Then a motion to approve minutes of August 28th and of March 26th. So moved. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Then, Mr. Scanlon, you're on with the presentation of our right. latest audit. On the stand, sit. Oh, right up. Yeah, we're already comfortable with it. Or one <laughs> Stand at the podium, I guess. Uh, the, the audit went uh, really good this year. It's uh, we're a little bit later because of uh, the old Feb report was a little delayed in getting. We usually report around January or March, um, so it's a matter of fine tuning that. Um, a little delay in it. Uh, I just want to add that that's from a different consultant, uh, Larry Stone. And it was the first year, right? This was the first, first year that Larry did year. it, yeah. So I had a little, little bit to do with the uh, transition as well. Um, some highlights. Uh, I should have three reports in front of you. You have the thicker one is the financial report, um, which I'll kind of talk about first. Uh, that's why not it takes place. Uh, we're opining on your financial statements. Um, so give a kind of a brief overview of what an audit is. I know uh, a lot of people associate the term audit with uh, finding fraud, um, and that's not really the case. That's not your purpose of an audit. Your audit is to consider fraud in your financial statements, uh, but your overall goal on fraud is to opine on your financial statements. Um, we will find here a lot. That's what I say. <laughs> so here are the three of material misstatements. Um, so the, the city received uh, an unqualified opinion um, on its financial statements, which is the best opinion you can uh, get. Um, there's no qualifications, which is good. Um, it's good. The bonding companies uh, like to see that. Um, I know there's been instances uh, of communities going out to bid, and certain institutions, financial institutions, will not bid on their bonds because they have a qualified opinion. Um, so it does, does pay um, to have an unqualified opinion, which is good. Um, some other highlights uh, by the financial end, uh, your free cash is uh, approximately about $2.8 million. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later on in the management letter. Um, your OPEB liability, which seems to be kind of the uh, term, the hot term right now, um, with other post-employment benefits, which is mainly health insurance for your retirees, uh, what it comes down to. Your liability is just over $18 million at June 30th, 2012 fourth year of reporting it. Um, so that liability continues to grow. I think it grew uh, $7 million this year. And that's basically what it is, is the actuary performs a study and develops your OPEB costs and helps you determine your ARC. It kind of mirrors your pension cost. Uh, same sort of actuary study takes place and develops your ARC. Except on the cities on the pension side, you're paying the ARC to the pension so the liability doesn't grow on your financial statements. Um, or on the health insurance one, the OPEB, you earn your pay as you go, you're paying the premiums as people retire. Uh, the way the OPEB uh, has been working, um, the way bonding companies have been looking at uh, communities is, did you do gas before 45? Yes, you did. Um, how is it on your financial statements? Well, you got a liability growing, which everyone suspected. Now, people are looking at what are you doing? Are you going to fund um, your OPEB or attempt to fund it? Either through an OPEP trust or do as a multiple stabilization. Um, so I think that's the next steps for the city that I would recommend is looking ways to fund your OPEP uh, costs. Um, especially, I know right now there's uh, legislation to change significantly health insurance uh, costs for retirees. That is going to play a huge impact on your uh, OPEP liability. Uh, so I think now I know on some of the bonding calls we have, they are asking is there how you're funding it, how are you going about OPEB. And I think you did all the necessary restructuring with your plan, um, which they want to see, which has an impact on your OPEB. So now it's kind of come down to, well, are you going to do an OPEB trust fund? Um, so I think the next steps here in a couple of years is the city should think about adopting um, an OPEB trust. And 
think about funding it. Wasn't the Commonwealth, because I know we were somewhat restricted by them, yep. weren't they going to do some legislation to make it easier for communities? Yeah, they did. They passed, uh, I think it's chapter 32, section 20, that allowed each, uh, the local level to adopt that. Um, so that's what you adopt, to the easier funding mechanism in adopting that, you can keep it at the local level. I think at first, the legislation came out was the money was going to be turned over to PARAC, you pay it in. Um, but that legislation allowed you to keep it at the local level. Um, and I know adopting a trust, um, I know some of the questions that have come back to me is, oh, geez, it's an irrevocable trust. Once we put money, we can't get it out. Well, that's not the case, because you can charge expenditures there for uh, retirees' health insurance premiums. So just because you put it, that's how you get it out by charging expenses. Um, you mentioned that it, you can also do an OPEB stabilization rather than a trust. Yeah. The most important thing is that you're putting money away. Um, but there's a measure of geography on your balance sheet. A true OPEB trust will reduce your liability as you put money into it. Where if you establish a stabilization fund, you, it's going to grow, a fund, your fund balance will grow, but you won't reduce your liability. So it's just a matter of geography. It comes to the same answer. If you're going to put $2 million into a trust or a stabilization, you will see the liability get decreased on a trust where if you're just going to do a stabilization fund, the liability would stay the same, but your fund balance would grow. So it's more geography on that. Uh, now, a couple of my clients uh, like the idea of a stabilization better because you could always go get the fund uh, with the town meeting vote or city council vote. Uh, now, do the bonding agencies that affect the bonding agencies at all if we are responsibly addressing that liability by reserving for it in, either as a trust or as a... Yes, it does. It does it there. It definitely keeps you in good eyes with them. Um, it counts as a reserve. Um, yeah, the bonding companies are looking at what you're doing and you should. So right. you, they, they make the distinction between the stabilization fund and the trust? They, they would rather see an OPEF trust um, because it's reducing your liability. I've seen communities that adopted the stabilization, you know, they, they explained it to them, well, this is what we did, so you're seeing our fund balance grow. Right. So they had to kind of point it out to them. Um, it's essentially a semantic difference. Correct, exactly. But, but all, all things being equal, they prefer trust to Correct. Those are their semantics. Yes. And it's permanently committed to that. Correct. Absolutely. How big is the state's of that trust? Their liability? No, their trust fund. I don't know. They probably don't have one. Yeah. They spent a lot of money on You know, I don't talk about them, but I don't know. I know they have one. I just don't know what. I, yeah. Probably zero. Federal government? Federal government, yeah. I don't even know if federal government's even audited. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know if they produce financial statements, to say it's true. Well, fortunately for both those entities, they, they can run deficits. Yeah, I mean, OPEP, um, I've always said somewhere in there lies the truth. Um, it's definitely a promise you made. It definitely has to be, there has to be some kind of cost from an accountant point of view. It's a cost. It's just that I don't know. I mean, the whole world's on a pay as you go. Um, it's how you manage it, I think, is more important than funding your full arc. But somewhere in there lies the truth. That it is a cost and it should be in the financial statement somewhere. It should be part of your budget. It just yeah, but having no plan other than pay as you go is not a good idea. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So someone there, a nice hybrid would be, um, I think, would be appropriate. Uh, but it, the way the bonding companies are looking at you in that aspect, and that's where it's affecting you as, as a city from an overall management point of view. Um, but you're in the boat just like everybody else. Tom, you indicated that the legislation has frozen the um, retiree health insurance rates at least till 2016 if it passes. Yeah. But if we, after 2016, reduce our retiree health insurance benefits to the minimum, 50 mm -hmm. 50, that would significantly impact oh, yeah. the OPEP. Yeah, so we have, we have options to reduce this liability in the future. Yeah, I believe the way legislation is written, uh, they're going to have to complete 20 years of service and retire. So people that aren't meet that 20 years aren't going to be eligible for your health insurance. Right. So right. So now the criteria for health insurance eligibility is going to change 
too. So that'll drop a few more people off. So. That's pending. That is That's a pending. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's been correct. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that's, I think that those laws that people are talking about that is a direct result of OPEP. Uh, and you can see on your financial statements, it is, it is putting you into a negative. The liability is growing on them. But it is because you have to pay as you go. Um, and then uh, some other uh, aspects uh, about uh, your financials. Uh, your governmental debt is about $49 million outstanding at June 30th. Um, and your enterprise debt, which is your utility charges, your water, your sewer, and your landfill, uh, your water debt is about $26 million. Outstanding sewer is $3.7 million, and your landfill is about $883,000 outstanding. Uh, this is just a general note, I, as a kind of uh, financial, financial practice, you don't want your debt budget to exceed 10% of your or overall budget, uh, I believe it's around 8% or over 8%. Category there, uh, you know. I think the debt is very well managed uh, at the city level, which uh, I'd like to point out. Um, that's about it on the financial end. Unless there's any specific questions uh, you had on the actual report, we'll probably talk about that all day. Um, the two other reports that are in uh, front of you. Uh, one is the A133 audit, which is on the federal awards. The city gets approximately $6.2 million in federal awards, um, ranging from education grants to uh, water stabilization grants to QSEBs, uh, you name it. The cities would then be well versed with uh, federal funds. Um, we had one compliance finding. Um, I, in my opinion, it's immaterial, but I still have to report it. Is on the school grants, you started spending school grants in July and August. Uh, the grant award date starts September 1st uh, for transportation. We still have reports to the federal government. It was a legal expenditure, but the time period it occurred was not in compliance with the grant. Um, and I, you know, I feel the school department took in proper rectified action. Um, so it's not too, too worried about it, but it's still something I have to report. Um, I think it's important to know how much federal funds are going through your city. Because uh, federal funds have a lot of compliance requirements with it. Um, sometimes when you have grants, it can be burned some to the administrative end on uh, a compliance requirement. Um, even though it may be good for the city, um, it's what the compliance comes with it after the fact. And we kind of talk about that in the management letter. Uh, the third report is the management letter, uh, which I've always said you're never going to see a good thing in a management letter. Uh, even though I think, you know, from an audit standpoint, uh, I think the city is very well managed. I think it takes its liabilities and its financial reporting uh, serious. Um, and from an overall perspective, I think financial reporting is in good condition. Um, what I mean by that is when a financial transaction happens within the city, it goes through the system that's properly accounted for, um, for a resident coming in and paying their excise bill or real estate bill when that money goes into the counter. Um, you can be assured that it's being properly accounted for and that the system is making the bank and being reported on your financial statements. Um, I think that's always good to point out. Uh, from a management letter uh, perspective, you know, I like to view these uh, not really criticisms and, and trying to knock down the city or the departments, but more of opportunities to take place to strengthen, to be more operating efficient, um, to kind of to point out the overall of the city. Um, in the management letter, you'll see three kind of type of criteria where you put them in. Uh, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies. So those two terminologies kind of speak for itself. Uh, the city has none of those. Um, so you can see these are all other matters, um, which reduces the level of um, what we talked about. Uh, on our first point, um, the utilization of free cash, I think it's very important for a government body, management, always to know where free cash is coming from. Um, I see it, it's always a key term, um, you know, people relate to free cash, right, you know, exactly what it is, but it's just, you always hear people want to know what it is, you know, one of the key terms, they don't care about the odds, they want to know what the free cash is. I know the city the past couple of years have had low free cash. Um, and this year, it was certified about 2.8 million. 
And what we wanted to point out here is where it came from. Um, the return of unexpended appropriations of about a million dollars. Um, excess over budget and local receipts, 365. So within your current budget, you generated just under 1.5 million. And I think that's important to know that's coming out of your current year budget. And the differences are one-time items that are making up this 2.8 million. 2 .8 million. Uh, close out of ambulance reserves, 850,000. Uh, close out the non-expendable portion of the bond premium. So you, bond, you issued bonds and part of it was uh, exempt uh, two and a half. That piece is restricted on your balance sheet to reserve every year to reduce the tax rate. Uh, the difference is close to free cash. And then your prior year unused free cash is uh, about 267000 So just a little under half of your free cash that comes from one-time events. Um, so if you, again, these items, if you use them for reoccurring expenses, say for payroll or meet the needs of current operations reoccurring, um, you'll find yourself getting into a hole pretty quick. So a good base, um, 3 to 5 percent, DOR recommends, the Sound Financial Practices recommends your free cash should be at uh, of your budget, I think the 2.8 million gives you to about just over 3 percent, 3.5 percent, so you're within that limits. Uh, however, you're really not because 1.5 one time um, type things. As far as bond companies look at you, um, reserve should be in the category 10 to 15 percent to be in a double A rating. I think the city last time uh, we looked at what we mean about other reserves is free cash, stabilization fund. Parking would be considered a reserve for uh, the city. Sale of real estate would be considered a uh, reserve. So your stabilization fund at June 30, 2012 was 695000 um, Your parking and your energy rebates you have in other reserves comes about 1.4. We add all those up, they come to just under 5.4 million. Um, and your budget's approximately 78 million. So you're under the 10%. Um, I think it's very important to say the size and how it impacts your bond. I know I've always encouraged it's easy for me to get up and say, hey, build up your reserves, build up your reserves. Um, but in this case, you, you should. I mean, you should really have some fund balance policies established uh, and really be committed to them. I know it's uh, easy to say, but hard to do. Um, but I think for cities as a total, it's just a well rounded how it impacts you in the bonding uh, world. Uh, I think it's very important. Yeah, you know, it, it, even you know, I it, we have several communities across the storm that hit in October. Um, we have a couple communities that just transfer out of free cash and have to borrow any monies, and you know the impact. You know, we're talking five or six million dollars that they just. And we have other communities mm -hmm. that are borrowing, trying to survive on it. So you can, the use of reserves and the establishment of them and how you look down the bonding market plays a big plays a key role. And Tom, when you say 10 to 15 percent, you're talking about general fund revenues, right? Yeah. What, what all those reserves and the reserves being free cash, stabilization, parking, sale of real estate. Correct. All of those should add up to somewhere between 10 to 15 percent. Of Correct. The fund. Okay. Sorry, I was late. Lost track of time. In the rock pile. In the uh, last day. <laughs> Did we rectify the kayak machines for parking? Did we put tapes in them? And <coughs> He's coming. It's coming. That's, yeah. that's coming. Oh, no, well, I thought he was talking about, talking about the parking. No, you see, so that's number five. Aha. Yeah. We're, uh -huh. we're, we're getting it too. Yeah. He just jumped ahead, that's all right. Okay. Sorry, jumped oh, no ahead. <laughs> He's, he, he, we played it with <coughs> I don't know if you have any more questions about the reserves or. Well, I just want to make a comment that, that so this was part of our all of my budget presentations was there was a whole segment on our reserve position and our management letters in the past and our bond rating letters and that this was one of the pieces that we had to focus on. So and we are proposing to put additional doubling or our commitments to these fund line items in the budget. So it's, yeah. In, in the context of our of, of your the, the proposal you have for the proposition to have override you also establishing stabilization account that's uh, that will um, take the balance of the money that is remaining after the deficit is offset. 
that stabilization fund virtual they coined a really painful phrase the old lock box that, that would that be reflected in any way to our to the good for us right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. absolutely yeah. I mean uh, I mean that's when you go out in the bond market yeah that's what they want to see they want to see your commitment to establishing reserves and having a policy and having a plan well, this is a four-year projected plan. Yeah, even if that plan is to use them four or five years down yeah. the road, at least you have a plan in place and you, you're addressing the issue. Yeah, I think that's a Yeah, I think that's a long time. The other thing we're, we were also uh, beefing up our our contribution to uh, capital stabilization. Right. The half a million dollars to the budget, which last this year will be back in today. So it definitely can the next time we see this. Yeah, we're, that's for 14. We're still. Yeah, I'm just looking forward optimistically. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to get there all in one year. But right. I think what they recognized, at least the bond raiders recognized last time, is that they saw them making progress right. in the right direction. Good faith effort and investment so, towards yeah. it. All right. All right. Okay, you want to have a plan. I mean, that's, that's what we're seeing out there with other communities. Um, you know, well, most important things have a plan and have, and have reserves. And it's always. So that's what reserves are there for to spend. Um, so I don't I don't think we actually mentioned it for people watching the video of this. We're talking about fiscal year 12. Here, correct. Right? Yes. Yes. And we're just wrapping up 13. So correct. Yeah. This is for fiscal year correct 12. Um, second kind of recommendation we have is review your indirect costs for enterprise funds. Uh, this is kind of it's in all our 80 something clients reports. Uh, really focused on it and getting them more defined and getting them in written form. I know it's a little appropriate. I know the city's had uh, indirect costs for the past uh, numerous years uh, using a percentage, um, but maybe fine-tuning them and getting them more direct, like on the health insurance, they have taken percentage, using actual on that. Um, and optimistically, or, you know, get them signed off by the two departments, water and sewer. Um, again, we found nothing wrong with the indirect costs being charged, just maybe it's time to revisit and look at it and kind of formulate a different uh, base because things change, you have new retirees coming in, people retiring, new employers um, on the plan. So I, I think that's one, one area that you need to revisit and look at and establish a, a framework. And I did, uh, when I did the indirect costs for the 14 budget, I did go back and change some of the methodologies to make it fair. Um, some of the percentages hadn't been revised since we brought the water treatment plant online. Mm -hmm. So actually there's a lot more staff that we weren't in getting indirect costs for. So, um, But putting that in writing would be good because when I took it over from Chris, all I had was the spreadsheet with formulas. I had no direction on how any of the things were derived. So now that I've changed some, I'm going to try to write it up and we'll have it as a as a yeah, you can policy. revisit every three years, you know. Yeah. Um, but again, that's not directly pertained to the city's kind of a generic. And you know, we've been finding all over the place. Uh, DOR has been really focused on direct costs too this year. So, um, our third uh, kind of point is uh, improved bank reconciliations. And I think that I know we talked to uh, the treasurer about it. If you have procedures in place to balance the cash to the general ledger and the cash book to the General ledger on a monthly basis. Um, this is more fine tuning up to the bank statement level. What I mean by that is balancing to your check register to relate to your home, taking your bank statement, balancing to your check register. We're talking about items that are all under seven thousand dollars, so it's not material to financial statements. Um, and I know, I mean, your cash balance is approximately what fifty million, George. So he's talking fifty million and seven thousand, um, and again. I know sometimes it comes down to a, a time time limit um, type thing, but I mean it's important to be uh, getting your cash is your largest asset on your balance sheet. It's kind of the most transparent, um, so really fine tune them and getting them down to the penny. Right. Uh, number four, you know the city uh, definitely from an audit standpoint. You're, 
definitely aggressive and you're, you're out there on the leading edge on a lot of technology <coughs> and then creative ways to finance and getting your QSEBs and your Krebs bonds and your WPATs. Um, all these are complex financing um, that can have significant compliance requirements with it. Um, I know one of the ones we talked about uh, with uh, Susan was on the QSEBs and the Krebs. They have a three year limit from the date you start. Um, which I think is this December of 2013, you have to have the money spent. Um, it's a fine, it's, it's kind of a hidden compliance requirement in there. So something to be aware of. Um, I know I have to point to you, I think you have what, 1.3 left in there. Um, so it's very important when you're applying for these grants or these type of programs, um, that the person in charge of these programs really is constant communication with with uh, your finance department. I know the school department has a lot of grants. Uh, they have a grants manager and school business just monitoring that. So the issue is not with theirs. It's kind of non-school related projects. Um, and again, you've got some complicated programs. So I wouldn't say to the extreme where hire a grants manager, um, just be aware of if the department heads applying for a grant could really look at the compliance requirements behind it. Um, so so what are the QCEPs and Krebs? That's, which of those, what are those bonds? Those are the energy bonds. They're energy bonds. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's Related under. to the ESCO. Got it. Yeah, and you have, right. to, you have to spend that money by three years, and there's other requirements, and it's the administrative end of it is the way, you know, they're fairly new, so when they came out is, there's a subsidy based on it from the IRS right. is how to handle that subsidy. Like, do you run it through a special revenue account and pay? How do you, when you vote the budget, do you vote net? Um, so it's all those different kind of nuances with something. You know, when you go out and, and borrow it, it's just added an administrative burden onto your finance staff. Um, so I think that's kind of important to know from our perspective that you do have a lot of complicated programs going on, um, and it can be a burden to uh, Bonds, the reason you, you utilize them is because they often offer much lower Correct. attractive financing. And, Correct. Um, so we do choose them just because they were complicated. Because Correct. Only you chose them. Yeah, I mean, the benefit yeah. you get out of it is extreme. It's just. Yeah. But you're saying part of the calculus of the cost benefit analysis is an administrative cost. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you really, you know, one, I mean, the biggest one in there, why I point that out, is you have that three year mark. Right. Um, so the time pressure. Time yeah. Pressure. Tell you the truth, I don't know what happens if you don't make the three year mark. I don't know if you have to return the whole bond. I don't, I know maybe they extend you six months. I, well, I'm sure. I, <laughs> I've, I've never, I, I haven't come across someone meeting that mark. So, well, it's it's a good point for us to be checking in with central services to see where they are as far as pension is concerned. Is Chris or Dave, is their family with their province? Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure they're up on the compliance piece, okay. but if we would. Yeah, and I think, yeah, that's, it, 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 it was a good program for the city. Right. Just the person that's usually in charge of the program probably is not thinking of county. No. Yeah, and that's uh, trying to right. get the two to a join. Sometimes with these, these programs, the county plays a key piece in that. Um, and sometimes it's hard to relate to is putting in windows right into an accounting right. <laughs> mechanism that do it too far apart. Um, so it's all right, that's, we're trying to get that communication gap down. Uh, and those are the, the current year uh, kind of recommendations and findings. On, uh, for our, our prior year, we kind of let's way lay out a management letter on the parking. I know parking, uh, we kind of visited that last year and found uh, some issues. I think the city uh, addressed that with management oversight and restructuring and the revenue stream so we can compare analytics. Uh, we looked into the bonding issues we had. Um, so I thought. Management oversight can play a key role in for compensating controls. You may have, have lack of segregation of duty or the technology you're using, you're not using it to its fullest. So management oversight is kind of a key a key control in, in departments like that. Um, so kind of pleased what, how you restructured, segregate your revenue streams so we can do analytics on there. I think your next step, um, 
to get fully, is I'm, I'm not sure I would do this, is utilize the technology. And what I saw in the technology, I, I it's very complicated. Um, you know, inserting, getting the receipts off those meters and inserting the keys, uh, paper getting jammed up. Um, so that would be your next aspect if you wanted to take it to the fullest. Uh, I think what you did, managed both site is definitely a key role in having monitoring and that sort of. So you, you reduce the risk uh, from our standpoint significantly. Um, but if you wanted to, you're not utilizing the full technology if you want to, um, but you'd really have to have, really that would be a kind of a think tank process, really what you're getting into on the technology side. And the only comment I would add is just that we are in the process right now of uh, doing a um, kind of a, 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 a technology review yeah. of, of our current, because a lot of what we put in now is uh, a lot of our systems are somewhat dated. There's a lot of new stuff out there that's come along, and so mm -hmm. we are taking a look at that, uh, including some, the garage system and yeah. some of the other, because a lot of what you're talking about, uh, you know, is now done. Our systems are modern, but they're, they weren't actually put in during the time of Wi-Fi, right. and so you know now it's all done like real time. Like you know those machines send their information over the internet directly to a central. You know ours don't have that capability right now, so we're looking at. So that's one of the ways that you literally get real time reporting on all your machines. Are you, are you looking at integrated systems? I mean that's yes, the other thing. These we're, don't necessarily. They're all individual technologies that are separate software. We're looking at integrated technology. We're looking at that. And one of the things we're uh, I'm asking Central Services Department to do is to, is to, is to we're going to look at uh, hiring a, a professional that can help us do an analysis of what our current technology needs are and what we can be doing to upgrade. So the system, again, our park, the garage system, just by way of example, was state of the art at the time. system and I was just in um, Cape this weekend they all you know it's nice. great. so it's I mean, the problem with being an early adapter is yeah you're the early adapter but then a few years later other things have come out so I think what you're saying is to is where we is where we want to go and that's what we're looking at obviously right, that's yeah. an investment but we but it, that would actually give us the, the clear, clearest correct that's you know that'd be your ultimate internal control segregation of duty I mean, if you went that technology, like we have a couple of Cape Towns where they have that new technology, and you do that, it restructures from all around from the, how you go out there and collect it now. I mean, there's cards now, it's almost no money exchanging hands and coming to our community. Yeah. So that everyone's role has to change. Okay, this is how we're going to segregate the duties, this is how we're going to balance coming in. So to do that, you really have to get a think tank going on. Um, technology would change all your procedures. And I, and I think in the back end, the office, and you have one comprehensive system that monitors all the parking uh, funding systems with the same software, same spreadsheets. Well, we are, I mean, we, one of the things that's not really spelled out in here is we did start to utilize more of the software we already had. So okay. one of the things that was called out was the parking passes. We're now managing those within within our software that we've had. Right? Right. We didn't have, it wasn't being managed that way. Now managing it within the software, so we're keeping track of it, and uh, so we are trying to use the software we currently have to the fullest to, to a more extent. Um, but that would be, yeah. I mean, I, I look at it now when we, you know, when an ambulance pulls into the garage, automatically the, the billing gets uploaded to the internet and goes right to our billing company. Right. Right now, instantaneously, what's happening? You know, it's it's all done wirelessly. Right. And that's the new trend in parking meters. And, and then you've got cities like San Francisco that are not only using that, they're literally changing the prices. They're using it as a price they setting. Do, they do. Uh, so really? they're yeah. looking at how what the occupancy are of parking meters, and they're doing real-time, uh, you know, market-based pricing. So if there's heavy usage in one area, the prices go oh, yeah, up. Yeah. Uh, if there's vacancies in other areas, the prices go down. They're, they're, this is what they're doing. They have sensors that can detect what parts of their city, what parts of their parking system is 
more for it. I, I get a little going. peevish if I'm part of a rates change while I'm They don't change while you're <laughs> doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they, they just, uh, yeah. Okay, they adjust according to uh, intensity of use. Yeah, to try to encourage turnover. Dinner so, hours in your restaurants. Yeah. So I'm not awesome. saying that's what we're looking at, I'm just saying, but that's where the technology is going. It's a good idea for a new bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah, I think I think one of the procedures we're going to do next to uh, this upcoming audit is uh, I think we're looking at parking tickets and looking at the receivable on that and what you can do with your software. I mean, that's one aspect I know we're going to venture into to see if there's any way we can establish a receivable uh, through the software. No, technology Munis software has changed so much in the past couple of years that so I know that's one aspect we're gonna look at next year. And then parking, I know. Do you were asked about the kiosk receipts? Yeah. I'm just curious as to whether we verified that. Yeah, the kiosk receipts you're utilizing now, you're out of heat out of the machines out here, you're balancing to them, they go to the treasurer's office or collector's office independently and they're checked. Uh, so it's more oversight on that. Um, I know you, what you want to do, which is almost impossible because you got new technology coming, was segregate those funds, like collect all the kiosks, which are changing the routes, getting that a single deposit, and having the kiosk be a separate deposit and tie out to the kiosk receipts. You're doing that indirectly. You're collecting them. Um, they're being verified at, at that level. They're making its way over to the collector's office. They're being verified, and then the deposits are being coming up. At least it's being checked before the deposits are being coming over. Um, so technology would change that aspect of it. But you are using the kiosk receipts now and balancing out to them. I know there's. I know the ones we've checked. I know there's sometimes they get jammed up or yeah, you know, they might be off a dollar. But um, once we check, we probably check about twenty days. And I know on the meters that was a little complicated. I think that's it's sticking the thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that's another hard one. Yeah, you that. can look at meters, but there are all these faults. Correct. Uh, there are like faults. Um, dirt gets in the machines and it triggers a fault. So it, there are sometimes those are off sometimes. Yeah. Foreign coins. Foreign coins get put in. Yeah. And it screws it up, and so those are a little bit more. Um, but even those now are going. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the kiosk you're using, the meter electronic things you're not using, and I'm not even too sure you can use it. I mean, the way, like, the, all those faults in there, it's, you'd be there for all day trying to figure out all the faults, and you wouldn't collect any of the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but at least the kiosk, which you, you, you use a lot, you're utilizing that control in place. Um, risk assessment. Uh, we kind of, uh, again, what we'd like to see is, again, it's your internal control structure. We're going off checklists and using analytics and kind of doing interviews with people, trying to figure out where departments. I mean, we're always going to hit your cash and your receivables because of your biggest assets in the past, so we're always going to audit that, those departments. But to get out to the other departments, um, we're using analytics, comparing this year to last year. We're talking to people. We're using um, economy-driven factors. Uh, you know, obviously, if you have a building boom going on, we expect to see building inspector receipts go on. So we'll look at that. Um, so again, we'd like to see more of like the city uh, the internal control is. If you have cash decentralized, uh, you know, for instance, trash bags being sold, uh, what procedures do you have in place that the stores are paying on time? Um, those type of uh, at least once a year sitting down and looking at uh, different outlier departments. Um, could be a stream of issuing receipts at the police department level. Okay, what procedures do we have in place when cash is collected? Uh, do we only take check? Uh, how is it documented? Um, so we're talking about those outlier departments outside of treasure collector type things and really looking at what procedures we have in place. Although a transaction could happen out there, it's not material to financial statements. Um, Still, you know, public confidence uh, might be, you know, if a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars, but to us, to your financial statements, it's not material. But to the public confidence, it's material. So again, getting out there. That's one of my questions yep. about the trash bags, the yep. blue bags. 
like at Stop and Shop and yep. some of the pop stores that we have. I don't understand the money part of it because the stores are not making money. So how did they keep control of this money? Well, you know, we part that's one of the that's one of the areas we are going to look at during this current year under coming up. But we asked some questions, got the groundwork. Uh, I believe it's all on the billing. I believe a receipt comes in that gets delivered to the Department of Public Works from a company making the bags. Um, and then that bill is billed out to Stop and Shop, and Stop and Shop pays to the city. <coughs> I believe that's, the lay that's what we established. Uh, so I know that's part of the process we're going to look at this year to see how we actually are going to take a sample of those um, invoices that come from the company. And we like to see those pre numbered. Mm -hmm. um, so we can go down the line. So, you know, if you issued 50, we expect to see 50 bills going up to the company. So that's the process we're going to check uh, next time. That, but that, that's one of the areas I know we've talked to Joyce and to Susan about. Um, <coughs> maybe that be an area of risk assessment is, yeah, are we getting all the monies that we're getting? Do we have procedures in place? Uh, do we have procedures to ensure that we're getting the bills? Which would be, could be as simple as pre-numbering those. So when you went down and looked, you'd see, oh, 49's missing. Why is 49? So that's where that's exactly what we're talking about in risk assessment. Uh, more control than selling stickers out of uh, carpenters' aprons. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> software on carpenters' aprons are very Uh, proration of retirees held. We talked about that last year. I think we put procedures in place and we kind of said that. Um, water and sewer accounts receivable. Again, you're balancing them out and put procedures in place to balance it, which is important. Um, and then old outstanding receivable balances. Uh, you know, we had discussions about um, what has to be done. I think the plans in place to start addressing the issues. Um, and then how it's going to impact your overlay. I think that's uh, on, your, on your personal property end of it. Yeah, we talked about this today. We're going to try to clean up all excise, I think, up to 1994. And then personal property, I think we talked about doing at least five years that will hit the overlay for another 10 or 12,000. Put it in deficit, but at least we can clean it up. So. And again, we're, we're is older years, you, you're not saying, I'm not releasing it and saying uh, it's more cleaning up for financial statement purposes. So we take motor vehicle, the reason why we picked 94, because before 94 you couldn't market the registry. Um, so 94 is kind of the key year in there. Going forward is you reconcile, you have a deputy collector who's a third party that collects for you. Um, so if you balance those lists to the deputy, which the deputy is marked as a registry, it's more we're cleaning up your financial statements. It does not release. We're not saying, you know, she's we're writing these people off. The lien still takes place. I um, mean, you're securing that through a third party. So it's more financial statements at the end of it. Um, so if someone happens to move to Minnesota and they come back to Massachusetts and they go register the car and they have to pay back in 94, the money can still come into the city. Um, so you satisfied all your process and your ability to collect by leaning it. Um, but now it's just efficiency on your financial statements instead of putting a trial balance that's just long because you have 82 years on there. Now you know, we can get 10 years outstanding. Um, and then also when you're balancing every month, you don't have to go back 20 years and write down every month. Um, get it down to 10 years. Um, the key procedure there is balancing with the deputy. Um, if you don't balance with the deputy, I mean, kind of the whole procedure kind of goes on. Uh, then uh, number 10, uh, net school spending with Smith Polk. I know this has been an issue for several years that we talked about. Um, I know it's being addressed by the city, um, but I think it's kind of a unique uh, type of uh, environment that has happened. And then uh, established internal audit function. Uh, that kind of goes with risk assessment going out and actually auditing to say, okay, we do have procedures in place. Uh, we do have procedures to CAD cash collector to keep a cash book. You want to go out there, hey, are you doing it on a random basis? Uh, we're talking informal auditing. It helps over the overall audit process, kind of help us pick what departments we're going to get out to there. Um, so it kind of complements the whole audit process. And that's it. Um, 
you have any specific questions or, uh, you know, if you have any questions at any time, you know, don't hesitate to call the office out. Well, there's 11 things on the list, but I seem to recall six or seven years ago, there were more major issues on the list. And well, there'll always be oh, yeah. areas that need improvement, but they're becoming more minor over the time. Yeah, they're definitely, yeah, they're definitely minor. Um, of, of, of these, what would you flag as being the more critical? Uh, the reserves. You know, from, from an audit standpoint, I don't think there's like a, there's not a right. risk of material misstatement from, 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 from overall uh, financial institutions I'm looking at yet. Reserves and then not getting caught with those grants. Correct. Yeah. Those, 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 I those. need those up before they're final reports. Are Correct. Yeah, those are the two major things I would take out of here. And as always, if there's any areas, you know, you feel that the risk, you know, please let us know. It's always good to have that input. Um, the net school spending issue in yep. Smithville. Yep. But that, that's, again, that's actually more of a semantic thing, or, or at least, it, and I know this, this is probably, and I'm sure the mayor is really excited at the prospect of talking about this, but the, and this is more, involves a larger conversation, clearly, that the city has to have at some point. But I also know that we don't have the mechanisms in place for the same level of scrutiny and oversight for um, finances, at least at least we the councils. So I know Susan gets to see some dimension of the numbers, but maybe the, I don't know if the mayor is comfortable talking about this and uh, how it relates. Only to say that uh, you know, it's, it, I serve on the board of trustees. Issue. I, I now refer to it as um, the state's interpretation of net school spending. I don't, well, I don't accept that, that, that this is truly net school spending because I believe, and I think they believe, that, that, that we, this is such a unique situation that we're really the only community that has two net school spending numbers. Uh, there's, uh, to my knowledge, uh, we're the only community in the state that, that's given two net school spending numbers for all the children who live in our community. I mean, net school spending is metrics that deals with how much you're supposed to be spending on all of the children who live in your community. And so we have this unique situation where they've, well, they've interpreted that there's these two separate uh, numbers, um, although I would say that it has not been enforced um, uh, back several years. And there's been a, a kind of a, a, we've been looking at it cumulatively, what we're spending cumulatively on net school spending for all the children that. Um, and so uh, there is uh, there is a little bit of an issue going on with the, right now with the trustees. Um, the, the new superintendent is not uh, wanting to um, continue the status quo. Um, and so he's going to, I believe, pursue one path. I've already indicated to the trustees and the superintendent that I will be pursuing uh, another path in terms of looking at the structure of the governance of Smith Oak and Unify the two systems. Um, so, um, so that 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 you know that is uh, that this is not a new situation. <laughs> but on that point, I actually had a brief opportunity to speak to Treasurer Grossman, who actually approached me about it and spoke specifically about it. He felt that um, he was particularly keen on helping us reconcile uh, that he was concerned about. criteria by which were uh, analyzed and he I think he recognized he, he was expressing that he recognized that there is a that he, there might be an aspect of unfairness to that. He, he said he was of course he may be running for governor and he may have been just or trying to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Secretary uh, Treasurer Grossman oversees the Mass School Building Authority and so early in my right. time uh, as mayor I had a meeting with the Mass School Building Authority and the trustees about a building Science building project, which again is the project, etc. But one of the quirks of, of our current arrangement is that um, the city of Northampton is solely uh, responsible for the local share of a school building project. So 
none of the sending districts, or none of that. That's not part of the tuition. That's not part of as well as we're responsible for all the capital upkeep of all the buildings in the school. Um, and so it puts us in a very it's an interesting situation. If a, if, if a regional district, I mean, if a regional vocational school wants to build or wants to do anything with budget, it's Same all done right. uh, through a different set of laws, and, and there's an assessment to all the regional districts, and there's a process. But so so. The reason we were meeting with him was to, to, they were taking us out of the queue for that building project because there was no way I could say, oh yes, the city of Northampton is going to move forward on a 10 or 15 million dollar science building because we had, that was literally the moment we were trying to go out to bid for the police station um, as well as we have the DPW project that we're working on. So it's a diff it's so, so that's sort of the backdrop of the, of, and so as we were discussing it, one of their suggestions was, well, too bad you couldn't get the legislature to include capital as part of tuition, but, you know, um, but that's, but again, it's more gets back to this interesting court. So, um, so you know, obviously the net school spending is a, is a the uh, so-called net school spending is an issue, but I'm prepared to take it on um, and, ch and challenge it on a, on a number of different fronts, but also we're already beginning a conversation, and I'll be including that in my budget message and, and beginning a more formal process around looking at this issue of, uh, of the structure and the governance. Because um, so, we're clearly spending the money up there, it's just a matter of getting credit for it in the formula. It's a right. different it's a different way that it's calculated yeah. and it's not it's not it doesn't really truly uh, if you look at what we're spending per pupil, um, it's not really reflected in that what we're spending is not reflected in, in, per pupil. in the metrics that they yeah. use. Um, per employee. We're spending, no, I'm saying per pupil, which is right. what we look at. And but I look at that foundation yeah. level, and, yeah. and um, we spend a lot of money on the campus that doesn't trickle down to that. Exactly. And, and, so, and so we don't get credit for it. And so that's just one of the issues that we're trying to work with. Um, but I also want to be clear, I, 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 and I, we're fully committed to provide, it's a great school, they provide a great education. I, I'm concerned about how do we uh, keep providing that good education. Also provide education for all our kids. So um, it gets tricky running two school districts in one community. Exactly. Yeah. Is there something in your uh, like, only a third of the kids are from North Canada, is that correct? It's about it's under twenty five. It's about yeah, it, it fluctuates. Somewhere between twenty and twenty five percent of kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it why is it why do we have an appetite to accept more from out of town than in town. I understand that it was 38 kids from North Carolina that applied last year and only nine were accepted. Uh, that's a decision that's made internally, but um, obviously that- There's no difference in dollars from out of town. Uh, well, there's there's a there, is. There, is a, there is a big difference, isn't there? Although, although, although I would argue that North Carolina pays the tuition, it's just not called that. Is that, that, that's that's the seventy communities pay a tuition, but we we pay a tuition. And it's just not reported. And then so. Yeah, and, 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 and again, I, I, this is not a new um, conversation. This is a conversation that's happened among between several mayors and, yes. and the board of trustees. And yeah. it's an issue we've looked at. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've seen this before. And so, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, and so it's just now going to come to a head. And so uh, we'll, we'll work through it. And, and the mayor is correct because even with our former mayor, Linda Marie Claire Pickens, she had I don't know how many meetings with the community and so forth. Same issue. Mm -hmm. And one question about the ban that you did on the, um, the DPW does that affect us in any way in, in this report? That we're paying that back in, in three years. Is that in the yeah. FY14 budget? We'll be paying down. Portion of the borrower. We have to yeah. pay it off in three years because in years three, four, and five, if you don't bond, you have to start paying principal. Nobody so, looks at that as, as detrimental as long as we pay it, or is it just, I'm just, still, from an auditor's standpoint. No, that's. If we pay something and then we don't bond it, we have to pay it back. Correct, yeah. But you're doing it over, what, three years? Yeah, we, yeah. we've built it into the FY14 budget, both in the enterprise and the general. And we're, Okay, yeah, we're splitting that through enterprise. Right. Yeah, so you're still providing for it, just not doing it long term. 
So yeah. instead of issuing bonds and getting on a payment schedule, you're just paying that in advance. So yeah. same effect actually probably helps you out there in the bonding company. Yeah. The bonding so world. Get rid of that debt. Right. Yeah. And then we'll be talking about contribution. Yeah. When it's in that budget. <laughs> so, any more questions about the 12 for Mr. Scanlon? No. I just, I just wanted to have the Finance Committee aware that the charter changed the process of doing the audit. Right. Um, and that, um, in the interest of time, we would have had to hire an auditor to do the FY13 audit by September of last year, which we could not have done because the charter wasn't passed. So in the interest of time, I've spoken with the mayor and the chairman of finance about um, retaining Tom for FY13, since it's rather late. Um, and then by September of this year, the council actually has to take the lead on hiring an auditor. And hiring an auditor is not necessarily subject to Chapter 30B. So you the relationship you have, or you can choose to do something different. But the, you're supposed to retain an auditor for FY14 audit by September. So I just wanted to make sure that you know that. Are we supposed to, every year we're supposed to do that? I don't have the charter. The charter it, it says that you review it. I don't know that it precludes you from having a multi year contract. It okay. just says that it's now your process, and we're actually putting the the council's budget's going to go up extravagantly this year. So you'll see it's going up like 30 or 40 percent, but that's because we're putting the money in. Yeah, well, it's just you've got to cover that every year. No, I think that I don't think that it specifies that you have to. I think, but it's um, but that's just the time frame. Something you check off. Yeah. Before September ends. Yeah. So we have to do. And and as the mayor said, your the city council budget will have the audit line item rather than the auditors. You can change the color schematic and make it a little more attractive for the There you go. Say, hey, wow, look at it. I know you this time. Let's turn back to green, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. You don't want to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't have any. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Scanlon, very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks to the yeah. department heads who came to participate. Um, I don't. I apologize for being late. I'm not a problem. I had nice days. I don't know of any uh, topics that I did not reasonably expect to come up. Does anyone else have well, we going to oh, and, and well, Susan has, but we're, we're, what's the, uh, aren't we supposed to review um, uh, Wayne's proposal for, no? Come back to finance the finance accounts. Got it. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. So I had just one other announcement.